Let's take a look at Someday My Prince Will Come. Go ahead and wait till the end of the video to find out how to get access to all of these arrangements. So the first thing that you should probably understand about the real book is how important it is to not take it so literally. You need to look at the lead sheets within the real book as a sort of impressionistic painting of the song. A lot of context is either merely implied or just missing altogether when it comes to these lead sheets not to mention all the mistakes that can be found within the real book. At any rate, it's up to you to see or even at times provide context. It's up to you to understand what's in front of you and what your options are so you can make more deliberate and hopefully musical choices. The fact that lead sheets aren't even dedicated to a specific instrument speaks to how much context is missing and how important it is for the player to provide this context. What I'm basically trying to say is when you stop looking at the real book's lead sheets as literal depictions of the songs, you'll begin to make choices that make the music come alive. If you're new to MDEX Music, we create music books and apps, piano arrangements, and we discuss improvisation, songwriting, and sometimes we take music theory to strange and uncharted places. So subscribe and hit the bell and join us for exclusive access to our ever-expanding library of music resources. So here's a literal interpretation of what's in the real book. This is not how you want to play from the real book, not even as a level one interpretation. Playing everything in root position creates something that is both physically demanding and void of voice leading. And playing the melody in such a literal and simplified way does not do the music justice. So let's start our journey of interpretation with a few simple, easy to implement techniques. So what we're gonna do on the left hand in level one is merely play each chord on the downbeat of each measure using a combination of root position, inversions, and rootless voicings. Simple. So let's take a listen to the first eight bars and see what we have here. All right, so you may have noticed right in measure four, uh, we have our first example of an inversion. This G7 sharp five is in third inversion. You see the seventh, the F, is on the bottom of that chord. All of the G7 sharp fives in this arrangement are actually going to be inversions, and there are only implementation of inversions. Take a listen again. And you can hear how the voice leading from the E flat major seven to the G7 sharp five is much smoother and more musical uh, when we do it like that. Not only that, it's way easier to play, uh, physically speaking. And in the very next measure, we have our first example of a rootless voicing. I'm gonna press play so we can hear that. So that's C minor seven right there. Uh, you can see how it's voiced, uh, E flat, G, B flat, and D. Uh, there's no root, there's no root in this voicing. And again, this is gonna create from the previous measure and into the next, uh, smoother voice leading, more musicality. And it's something that's a really commonly um, implemented technique when it comes to these standards, these rootless voicings. We actually have a whole series on how to use rootless voicings, so check that out. Basically what we did here, I'll give you a brief summation, is we replaced the root 
with the ninth on this minor seven chord. That's it. Um, there's other there's other rules that apply to other uh, chords as far as how to make them rootless, but in this arrangement here, that's all we have to worry about. And as a matter of fact, all of the C minor sevens in this arrangement are also rootless voicings. Look at this F7 right here in measure eight. Uh, another inversion that leads nicely away from the C7 we came from and uh, creates a physically easier to execute sort of movement. So we have this idea of using inversions to create smooth voice leading and uh, to make it actually easier to play. And we're gonna implement that sporadically from time to time. So let's proceed on to the, to the next phrase. And this is just a reiteration of the, of the opening phrase of the song. Only in our arrangement here, especially if you look at measure 18, uh, we've made a little change in the melody. And it's just a simple rhythmic displacement technique. All right, not only that, in measure uh, 19, we've also changed the rhythm to have this dotted quarter note uh, take place. So we have basically here two forms of rhythmic displacement. Uh, the measure 18 example displaces the melody slightly later than it was originally intended to be. And then in measure 19, we have this other way of using rhythmic displacement where we sort of anticipate uh, the melodic note and we've done so by way of this dotted quarter note rhythm, uh, which puts this G that was formerly on the third beat, as you can see up here at this top line, by the way, this is the original melody. So now you can kind of compare and contrast in real time uh, the changes that were made and the enhancements that were implemented and when they were implemented. And if you look up here, you see this G was on three and now we've just slightly anticipated it by putting it on the end of two. All right, so let's take a listen to that phrase one more time and then we'll let it uh, venture into the second ending and talk about some of the things that happen there. So actually, uh, a lot of stuff going on there, especially uh, in the ending there. Here we have uh, an inversion of uh, the B flat seven and also a slightly more complicated uh, rhythm, right? So we're not just plotting onto this dotted half note. We're breaking it up a little bit and we're increasing the, the grid complexity, if you will. We're increasing the complexity of, of the rhythmic grid of the song and filling in the space that was otherwise unoccupied on beat two in that measure. So uh, that's something to talk about right there, right? Like the, um, the variety of rhythm being used here in measure, what is this, 26, is also something to be on the lookout for. And then we have our last line here, this little outro. Let's take a listen to that. Right here. We have this inversion of the C sharp diminished seven chord, uh, which creates a nice line from the previous measure. We had E flat, E natural, and then that line's gonna continue, look over here, to the F and then a G and then an A, and then ultimately on B flat. So we have a really cool, as a consequence of this inversion, smooth voice leading, physically easier to play chords, etc. cetera, uh, but also this really nice stepwise movement in the bass, which is something you hear us constantly preaching on about. Another thing worth noti uh, noting about the inversions that we kind of glossed over uh, was they allow us not only smooth voice leading and, and physically easier to execute chords, but they prevent us from placing these chords in, in octaves that will either sound too muddy and clustered up, that is if I go down, or in an octave or a register that kind of bumps into our melody or creates dissonance against the melody or overlaps the melody or obscures it. So there's all sorts of reasons for why the implementation of these inversions is useful. And, and that's one of them. And it's a really important one uh, worth noting. Moving on to measure 29 here, we have this, this C minor seven over F. So what's going on here with this C minor seven over F, right? 
If I were to play a C minor seven over F, I would need five notes to represent everything in that chord. And uh, I have five fingers on my left hand, so I guess the math adds up that that's feasibly possible. Um, that's not what we've done here. What we've done here is kind of just, well, highlighted the guide tones with these two half notes right here. We've got the seventh and the third of the chord. And the other important note, uh, the bass note, the F. And with that, that's all we need to sort of represent the C minor seven over F sound. It simplifies it, it opens it up a little bit, it lets it breathe, it just sounds a lot better. It's more conducive to that line we were talking about earlier. And we've, again, implemented that slightly more complicated uh, rhythm to fill out and make the grid complexity a little bit more. Now we're playing on two, whereas previously, you know, we weren't. So what measure 29, I guess, kind of illustrates to us is you don't have to take, like we said before, everything on the page so literally. You don't even have to play the chords, right? You could feasibly play through this whole arrangement with just bass notes on your left hand or something really, really simple. And that's kind of what's going on here in, in measure 30. We've simplified uh, this F7 chord progression uh, to just a G half note and an A. And this creates a really cool counterpoint against the melody. And this is informed by uh, the chord progression. And it's kind of informed by uh, that line that we've created over the last three measures. Um, so in, in, in this measure here, measure 30, that's what's going on. Something way more simple, way more reduced, and yet very, very effective. And finally, we culminate on our last chord of the piece, this B flat major seven, where we've definitely introduced some more rhythmic complexity playing on every single beat of the measure. And on this last uh, measure here, on the B flat major seven, we have, uh, we have all of our, our notes here. We have B flat, we have F, we have the major seven, the A on the left hand, um, and this D and this F, but we've also introduced the nine. And this is a really great tension. Uh, we haven't used any tensions uh, to this point, but this is a really great tension to introduce to a major seven chord. And that's what's going on here in this last measure. So let's, let's, now that we've talked about everything that happens in the song, let's go back and just take a listen through the whole thing and be on the lookout for all the enhancements and techniques that were implemented. And also keep in mind that this song uh, can sound great as it is in this, in this first level, this simplest form. I mean, what makes the song great is the fact that it's, it's these melody against these chords. So you, you already have like half the battle won there. You don't need to inundate your, your arrangement or your version of the song with super complex things like you see, you're gonna see later in the later levels are possible. Um, but this, this level for me is, is as viable, if not more so than some of the more complicated iterations of this song. Well, the moral of the story is sometimes less is more and you should be able to comfortably like lean into that and don't feel the need to go too crazy and you know, learn how to edit yourself. Let's take a listen. We're gonna make this arrangement and all the other arrangements as it relates to this series available to all of our members. So if you're not a member yet, go ahead and click on the join button or the link down below. Also join us next time as we talk about level two of Someday My Prince Will Come and all the things we can introduce in that level to make it come to life even more. For more awesome music theory related content, click on uh, that thumbnail right there. Join us next time and thanks for watching.